Now listen to Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. You're with me. Can you feel the heart of David here? By the way, death here is described as a shadow. A shadow can't harm you. A shadow can't defeat you. Because for us, as believers this morning, death is just a shadow. In fact, if you read Paul the Apostle, he talks about death just as a sleep. Just like falling asleep. If you've got your Bibles this morning, would you turn to James chapter 4, verse 8. If you want to find James, go to Revelation and start going left. I just have one verse this morning that I want to um, read to you as my main text. James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I've entitled this message this morning, God is trying to do something in you and through you, part six. God is trying to do something in you and through you, part six. And in case you've missed the other five parts to the message, uh, can I say that this message stands alone? If this is the only message you've heard of the six, that's okay. I believe God's got something for you today, and he's got something for me in this passage. We've been on a, a very interesting and important journey over this past number of weeks. We've been looking at how God is trying to do something in us and through us. We've established that God will not do something through you until he has done, done something in you. Does that make sense? Um, we've looked at why Christians go through the fire and why they go through the wilderness. And we've noted that the greatest obstacle to the presence of God is always sin and self. And that is what the fire and the wilderness is designed to expose and destroy in our lives. Last week, we fast-forwarded the tape to see how God's servants in this book came out of the wilderness experience. Uh, when one comes out of the fire, when one comes out of the wilderness, we noticed that they're stripped of any confidence in themselves. Amen? Uh, we come out of the wilderness, we come out of the fire totally empty. Um, we are totally devoid of personal hope in our own ideas, our own feelings, our own words, our own actions. Um, and as we come through these protracted seasons, it actually exposes our self-reliance. And actually at the end of these experiences, we see the utter foolishness of dependent upon ourselves. Brother, sister, this morning we are weak. Amen? We are frail. We are inadequate. So, I have a question. If this is true, and it is, if he brings you to a place of nothingness, and he does, how do we move forward? How do you move forward? How do I move forward? If he is bringing you to a place of nothingness, um, if you survive the fire, and if you survive the wilderness, and if it is no longer about you, then what comes next? Brother, sister, this morning, the answer to that is it's all about him from now on. It's all about our God. Now, please hear what I'm about to say to you this morning because we're getting right to the heart of the message. When you come through these experiences, you become totally dependent upon his presence being with you. I'll say that again. As you come through these experiences and you're devoid of any confidence in your own abilities or your own ideas or all of that, you become totally dependent upon the presence of God actually being with you. His presence should be the most precious thing in your life. After all, we're talking about the presence of God. 
We're talking about the God of all the universe wanting to have intimacy with you personally. From his presence comes his peace to comfort you. From his presence comes his power to achieve whatever he's asking you to do. From his presence comes his proclamations or the word of God to direct you from his presence. I want to look this morning at our utter dependence upon the presence of God being with us in whatever that we do for the Lord. Our text this morning was James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Kyle said this quite a, a while ago in a prayer meeting. If we draw nigh to him, then he is duty bound to draw nigh to us. Would you agree that that's what that text is saying this morning? By the way, God keeps his word. But experience in his presence sounds good and it sounds right. But how does that practically look this morning? Because if you were to push me over this past few years, I feel God's been really dealing with me not just to preach his truth, but to explain how does that practically look? How does that look in practical, real, everyday terms? So I want to try and help you this morning with my limited knowledge of this subject. I've written down a few things here and I'll, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. Get away from the distractions. If you want to experience his presence, you're going to have to get away from the distractions. You're going to have to leave your cell phone aside. You're going to have to turn the TV off. Then you're going to have to start to meditate upon him and who he actually is. You're going to have to leave everything that is weighing you down at his feet. You're going to have to repent of any known sin. You're going to have to try and reconcile with anyone you have ought with. You're going to have to open your Bible and expect him to speak to you. You're going to have to talk to him. You're going to have to thank him. You're going to have to worship him. And I'll say this. You're also going to have to be quiet in his presence. There's a time to talk to God, but also there's a time to be still. And the last thing I put here, you need to feel his peace. And a lot of the times that peace only kicks in whenever we're quiet. Yes, we unburden our hearts, so we we ask for forgiveness and we but I just believe that practically when we get into his presence and when we seek to feel his manifest presence, sometimes we have to be very intentional, very disciplined, because it's not long, I'm telling you, it's not long if you've got too much going on around you that it's very hard to even hear the voice of God. Would you agree? If you've got all the distractions going on when you enter into his presence, before you know it, it's just like, I don't even know what he's trying to tell me. Without his presence, you have nothing. You're on your own. Without the presence of God, we're all wide open. When the Lord draws close to you, the wicked are no longer dealing with you, they're dealing with him. When the Lord draws close to you, the religious are no longer dealing with you, they're dealing with him. When the Lord draws close to you, Satan and his demons is no longer dealing with you, they're dealing with him. The words you express and the acts that you perform after that are him and not you. So many people over this last few days have testified. They're saying words and they know that they're not words coming from themselves. They're words coming from the Lord. The Lord has just been speaking through believers to bring comfort into a very testing circumstance. When the Lord draws close, you're strong. He strengthens you. You're safe. It's there that you feel perspective. By the way, that's where you see the devil for who he is. He's a liar and he's a loser in his presence, in the presence of God. By the way, the devil is not welcome in the presence of God. 
just like darkness cannot abide light. Once you switch a light on, darkness cannot abide the light. Amen? Darkness has to go when the light's switched on. When you come into the presence of God, the devil must go. The devil cannot... I don't believe the devil even has the power to listen to your prayers. You know, people sometimes say, well, I'm scared to kind of open my mouth about this in case the devil hears me. I do not believe that the devil is welcome in the presence of God. 2,000 years ago, he was evicted from heaven. He's not welcome in the presence of God in heaven this morning. Amen? Amen? He's not welcome ever again. But when you personally, through the blood of Jesus Christ, enter into the Holy of Holies, which was ripped apart 2,000 years ago, you can have intimacy with God and the devil has no right to interfere with your communion and your union with the Lord. That is holy ground. That is sacred ground. When you're close to the Lord, you're focused on God. You're captivated with Him. You're privy to His secrets. He will open up His heart to you and reveal things to you in His presence. That means you're not focused on yourself, your problems, your carnal desires, your shortcomings or your hurts. That means that you're not focused on the faults of others. That means you're not focused on the devil, his lies, his temptations or his schemes. You are captivated with Him. C.S. Lewis says this, the real test of being in the presence of God is that you either forget about yourself altogether or you see yourself as a small, dirty object. There's no big, there's no big Christians in the presence of God. There's just a big God. Amen. When you're in His presence, you're small and He's big. Amen? Amen? Amen. There's no pride in His presence. There's humility. When you see Him for who He is, there's no pride. There's no boasting. There's no... Sin is a very ugly thing in the presence of God. So you start to feel sin the way God feels about sin. You start to all the things that maybe meant something 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, mean nothing because He is all the glory. He is all the beauty. He is all the attraction. He is everything in His presence. It's all about Him. The presence of God immediately strips the devil of much of his power. Your attention is in the right place. I want to say this again, brother, sister, there is nothing more important than the presence of God. If he is here today, and he is, we're blessed. If God is not here today, then this is just a religious sham. We're just playing church. We're just going through a religious shout. But if God's here, I'm telling you, this is precious this morning. Heaven on earth is to feel His presence. Hell on earth is to be separated from God. We have a wonderful promise when we meet together from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find it in Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Hallelujah. Isn't that lovely? Yes. There's more or two or three of us here today. He's here. That promise is being manifested this morning as we meet together. By the way, what makes heaven so blissful is the fact that we are going to be in His presence forever and ever and ever. Do you know what makes hell hell? It's not just the flames. It's not just the punishment. It's not. What makes hell hell is eternal separation from God. There's people that are separated from God in this life and in the life to come. But for us, we get a touch of heaven this morning. We get a touch of heaven every time we enter into His presence because we, we feel His presence here in life. But we, we're going to feel it in a much greater um, capacity when we see Him face to face. So we're getting a little touch of heaven this morning. You may say, preacher, I struggle to feel Him. 
I just, I, I never, I just struggle. I hear Christians talking about feeling the presence of God and hearing His voice. I struggle with that. Jeremiah 29, 13, 13 may help you. Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. I believe this is telling us that you cannot be half-hearted when it comes to approaching God. You cannot be hard-hearted when it comes to approaching God. You cannot be double-hearted when it comes to approaching God. By the way, double-hearted means a deceitful heart. So I want to say that once more. You cannot be half-hearted when it comes to approaching God. He said, if you seek me with all your heart, if you seek me with all your heart, you're going to find me. So you cannot be half-hearted. You cannot be hard-hearted. You cannot be double-hearted. It takes real effort to carry the presence of God. It re- takes real dedication and discipline. It takes death to self. It is the presence of God that attracts the anointing of God. Just because you're saved does not mean that you're abiding in His presence or that you can feel the manifest sense of His presence. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit within us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But I'm telling you the manifest tangible presence of God only comes by coming God's way. And by the way, just for the record here, Please do not think for one second that I am suggesting that I constantly, as a Christian or as a pastor, abide in His presence. I don't. I wish I did. There's times that I just get caught up with life like you. Or get caught up with myself. Or get caught up with others. Or get caught up with the voice of the enemy. And then I need to talk to myself and remind myself that this is not good. So this is something that we struggle with, just abiding in His presence. There's times I feel His presence. There's times I don't feel His presence. I get it that it's not that He's not there, but there's degrees of the the intensity of His presence. By the way, we're all still learning on this subject. And I think we'll always be learning until we see Him face to face. I think in eternity, the only regret that we'll have is that we didn't seek Him more. That we weren't in His presence more. We weren't seeking His presence more. Like we can function so easily today independent of His presence. And it doesn't seem to bother us, the fact that we can't feel Him. And then we wonder when we we do things, it's like, why, why is this so difficult? Because we're doing it in our own strength. We're doing it with our own understanding. And it's like, but all the time he's wanting to be there with with us. God's heart is to be with you as a believer this morning. God's heart is not for him to be distant. For this last over two years, I've never went through such a season where every day I have to battle just to feel his presence. I wake up in the morning, I don't feel the sense of his presence. I have to fight, I have to battle through. It's like nothing is easy anymore. I talk to pastors, they, they testify the exact same thing. I talk to Christians all the time and they're like, this is a very difficult season. Nothing comes easy anymore. It's like everything's a fight By the way, the only time that we feel Him strong is when we're in the Spirit. When we're sensitive to His voice. When we're at peace with Him. And we're striving to be in unity with those around us. As you read this book, you discover as God's servants came out of the wilderness, God's presence was the most cherished asset that they had or they required. They knew without him they were defenseless, powerless, and absolutely impotent. Moses said in Exodus 33, 13, talking to God, this was after his his great wilderness experience. 
If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Listen to what God said. My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And, he, and then Moses said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not thence. For here, wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? Basically, the evidence that, that we are we are who we are is because you're with us. Amen. The world looks on at the church and they know whether God is with you or whether he's not with you. Yeah. Can you feel the heart of Moses here? Mm. If you're not with me, God, we're not going anywhere. Basically, if you're not going to speak here, I'm not going to speak. That's what Moses was saying. If you're not in what I'm planning, then we're not in it. After his long wilderness, Moses knew that he couldn't achieve anything without God's help. Moses didn't want to be part of anything that God was not in, or he didn't want to go anywhere that God wasn't going to go. I put it to you this morning, believer. This should be the attitude of every one of us. A.W. Tozer said this, I want the presence of God himself or I don't want anything at all to do with religion. I want all that God has or I don't want any. Every child of God who grasps the, enormous, the enormity of ministry should know that unless he is with you, then you can achieve nothing. Can I ask a couple of questions this morning? Are you totally reliant upon him? Do you carry his presence? When you turn up in a situation, do you bring the presence of God with you? If you bring the presence of God, you'll have something to say. If you don't, you'll have nothing to say. God's people were not exempted from harsh trials and painful loss in this book. Do you know that? Read the stories of the great men and women of God in this book. And God did not cover them in cotton wool. But he did promise he would be with them as they went through what they were going through. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 43 2 says this, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. This passage is talking about those circumstances in life that look like they're going to overwhelm us. Just like it's too much. But God says, no, I'm going to be with you. They're not going to overwhelm you. I'm going to be with you. Alexander McLaren said this, Peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. Peace comes not from the absence of trouble or troubles, but from the presence of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. So what was, what's the main comfort here? That he's with us. The fire can be so intense. The wilderness can be so harsh. That you may even doubt that you're going to make it through. But this is a wonderful promise for you this morning and for me. That we're going to make it through because of him. One of the things that many Christians lack today is that manifest presence. Um, I backslid for 10 years from the age of 16 to 26. That's the biggest regret of my life. 10 wasted years. 
But I was shocked after 10 years, whenever I had left the church, and then after 10 years, I didn't even go through those doors. For 10 years, I came back. I don't believe I did. I can't even think of a funeral in that church that I went to. But I didn't go into the church because I was convicted. Every time I would go near the church or bump into a believer, I was convicted. So I just stayed away completely. But anyway, after 10 years, I come back and everything had changed. It was a different church. There was a lot of the old saints had gone on to be with the Lord. It just wasn't the same. But in fact, one of the main elders who was a godly man, um, he was promoted to glory. Real big influence in the assembly. And um, he was gone. And you know what it's like? It's like you're always looking back. It's not the way it used to be. Okay? But anyway, it wasn't just me. Um, That elder's wife was still alive. And um, she was having another conversation with another godly brother or sister in Christ. And she was asked this question. What's the difference between the church today and back in the day? What's changed? This is what she said. In the old days, God's people brought the presence of the Lord into the service with them. Today, people come to church to try and encounter the presence of God. That was a godly woman. That was a very godly woman. One of the old godly saints. Someone who just loved the Lord. Someone that was always there, always praying, always encouraging, always lifting other people up. But yet there was a a brokenness in her heart at how the church had changed over the years. What was the issue, this subject this morning? It seems like we've lost the art of cultivating the presence of God. We're so busy. Life is so busy. we've, We've all become religious We've all become active, and yet God is wanting to manifest himself in our midst. Listen to David in Psalm 51.11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, people wonder why God blessed David so much. David was a man like us. He was imperfect. He had his feelings. In fact, David did a few wicked things really wicked things. But the Lord loved David. But why why did God bless David so much? I put it to you, God blessed him so much because he valued the presence of God. He valued the presence of God. That was important to David. Read his life, study his life, and you will see that. By the way, He valued the presence of God so much, he wouldn't even dare destroy Saul when he could have. He had opportunity to stick his spear and take Saul out of the game when Saul wanted to destroy him. But he wouldn't. Why would he not do it? He was the Lord's anointed. He feared God, but he respected the presence of God so much. David knew without his presence, he was on his own. He had no confidence to move forward in the battle without the Lord actually being with him. Let me give you scripture for that. Or Sorry, I, I want to give you scripture and then I have more scripture to support that. But the first text I want to quote is Psalm 1611. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen? Amen. When... God comes close, we see him for who he is. When God comes close, we get a revelation of his ability. When he comes close, we can hear his voice. If we're distant, we may hear his voice in the distance, but we don't hear him clearly. But when you're close to him, you can hear him clearly. To value the presence of God is to value God. Did you hear me? To value the presence of God is to value God. This has to be 
the, the peak of human living or human existence. So often today, because of our own neglect, our own selfishness, our own unbelief, our own foolishness, we literally push God away. We push Him away. We go get so set in our ways. But I want you to hear me now. Even in the darkest situations a human can go through, death, we do not need to fear or despair. Now listen to Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. You're with me. Can you feel the heart of David here? By the way, death here is described as a shadow. A shadow can't harm you. A shadow can't defeat you because for us as believers this morning, death is just a shadow. In fact, if you read Paul the Apostle, he talks about death just as a sleep. Just like falling asleep. If you read the Old Testament, you will come across the Ark of the Covenant. Many times in the Old Testament, you come across the Ark of, of the Covenant. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant represents the active presence of God. It represents the presence of God in the midst of His people. Um, where you find the Ark in the Old Testament, you find the cloud of God's glory. Where you find the Ark, God's power was seen. Second Chronicles 6.41 and Psalm 132.8 describes the ark as the ark of thy strength. The ark of thy strength. You just have to study the history of the ark of the covenant and it will tell you how special it was. In First Samuel chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, Israel was attacked by the Philistines and Israel was decisively defeated. This battle was one of the greatest humiliations in Israel's history. This is what it records. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, were slain. Now please see here, when the ark of God's presence left Israel in Eli's day, God's glory left Israel. Without him, they were wide open. They were devoid of assistance. They were on their own. By the way, this is not a good place. Eli's daughter-in-law had a child at this time. In 1 Samuel 4.21, it says, She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Why? Because the ark of God is taken. This, this might have looked like some insignificant religious ornament, but this represented the manifest presence of God. Without the ark, Israel was powerless. And by the way, it's no different for us today. Without the presence of God, we're powerless. We're just going through the motions. Many of you may know part of this story where the Philistines in this story took this, this ark in 1 Samuel 5, 2, and they attempted to bring the ark of God's presence into the house of Dagon, their heathen god. Do you remember what happened? when they brought God's presence into that heathen temple? Dagon, it says in 1 Samuel 5, 3, was fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Brother, sister, the devil cannot abide the presence of God. He cannot. He cannot handle it. When Christ comes into a situation, evil must flee. Hallelujah. 
it must submit to our God. The counterfeit cannot operate. Light and darkness cannot coexist. This is why the genuine Christian feels out of place in the world. We can't get satisfaction in the world's pleasures. Amen? Many of us have went out there and tried to find satisfaction out there in the things of this world. And it left us empty. We used to sing a song, There's none but Christ can satisfy. By the way, as the ark remained among the Philistines, outbreaks of tumors and disease afflicted them, forcing the Philistines to return the ark of God to Israel. They couldn't handle the presence of God. By the way, the ungodly cannot handle the presence of God. When you come into the presence of God, you're either going to throw your hands up and surrender, or you're going to run. There's no in-between. There's no neutrality with Him. You're either for Him or you're against Him. On Judgment Day, you're either a lover of Jesus Christ or you're a lover of sin. The reason why people go to hell is they love their sin more than they love Jesus. Now, we're going to learn a little bit real quick of the heart of David. After David became king, the first thing that he did was he desired the return of the Ark of the Covenant. Think about this. He comes in as king. He's anointed as king. He's the man to lead this nation. And the number one thing he's interested in, we need to bring the presence of God back to Israel. That's the number one thing. By the way, during King Saul's entire reign, the ark had been neglected. This is confirmed in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3, where David testified, And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. Saul wasn't interested in God's presence. Saul, by the way, is a picture of the flesh. He was always doing things his way. Saul thought that he didn't need the Lord's presence, his strength, or his counsel. How foolish. Study the life of King Saul, and you will realize that he was more interested in destroying David than he was enjoy, than enjoying the presence of God. By the way, there's professing Christians that are like that today. You should be captivated with his presence. As hard as it might be to get your head around it. The reason why David became such a threat to Saul was notably because he carried the presence of God. That was it. That was it. That was David's crime. It says in 1 Samuel 18, 12, and listen to this. And Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And was departed from Saul. Instead of getting down on his knees and repenting. Saul decided to torment the one who carried God's anointing. This should never have been. Christian writer Stephen Furtick said this. Opposition doesn't prevent the presence of God. It provides an opportunity to prove the presence of God. You may be in this house this morning. You may be under attack. You may feel like you're under attack. But I'm telling you, when the enemy attacks us, it drives us into his arms. And sometimes the only thing that we have that can come out of our mouth is help. Help. We don't have a big theological prayer. Our prayer doesn't last for 30 minutes. Sometimes it just lasts for seconds. Help. But I believe it's in those prayers. I believe it's in those moments that God comes very strangely close. And you just feel His touch. Or you feel His whisper. Or you hear His whisper. And it's like, it's going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. You're not on your own here. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. I'm going to bring you out of this stronger than you went into this. 
because you're my child. I love you. I have a plan for you. And no one or nothing is going to stop you, even your flesh. The reason why he took us through the fire or is taking us through the fire. The reason why he has taken us through the wilderness or is taking us through the wilderness is because he loves us too much to let us call the shots. Your biggest enemy is you. It's not the devil. It's not the world. It's not the liberals out there. It's not the president. It's you. Unless you see that, you'll end up shooting at the wrong target. As I come to a close, in 2 Samuel 6.14, it shows the return of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. What a day that must have been. huh? I mean, can you imagine the excitement in the camp as the priests come walking along carrying this little ark? Can you imagine the feeling? God's cu- coming back to Israel. huh? As they, as they walked, there, there was bound to be a sobriety but also a joy at the same time. You can imagine them walking. Because you didn't mess about with that ark. You didn't put your hand even to try and mess about with that ark. Amen? Amen. You see, I'm not going to sidetrack, but whenever a man did that in the scriptures, he was struck dead. You don't mess about with the presence of God. What was David's response? Like, I want, how was David feeling? You know what it says? David danced before the Lord with all his might. Amen. Huh? David was having a party. David was rejoicing. You can imagine just the excitement in his heart. It was not just that David rejoiced at the return of the ark. Israel rejoiced. In 1 Chronicles 15, 28, it says, All Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sounds of the cornet and with the trumpets and with the cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. There was just such an excitement that was happening. The return of the Ark of the Covenant meant the presence of God was back. The glory and the power of God was being manifest once again. It was time for the enemy to take a hike. Devil, go. Go. Your day is over. Get out. It's the same with us. When we seek Him in this church with all our hearts, the enemy is completely stripped of all his power. All of his power. He gets his immediate eviction notice. When God comes to the fore, the devil must go. Abbot, Abbot nothing. He must go. He cannot abide the presence of God. So, can I just personalize this this morning? Have you been careless about the presence of God? Have you taken it for granted? Or have you been like Saul where you just function on a daily basis without any sense of him, his presence, his voice? It's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. But you don't seem to care that he's not with you. Or is it your cry, I can't do without you. I can't even get through a day without you, Lord. I need you. I can't even leave for work this morning unless you're with me. I need you to go before me. Are you absolutely dependent upon Him? I believe we're living in a day where if we don't cultivate His presence, it's going to be tough. Let us pray. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. God wants to be close to you this morning. You don't need to beg him. You don't need to twist his arm. God wants to be close to you. Will you let him? Will you let God come close to you this morning? One of the things, just the obstacles, the hindrances need to go. This is a very personal moment. I get it. This is a very holy moment for each of us this morning. I want to, first of all, ask, is there someone here and you're not right with God? 
You find yourself in God's presence this morning, but you know that you know that you know you're not right with him. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit is convicting you this morning. And you know that you need to get right with him this morning. I need him. I need his forgiveness. I need his presence. I need him with all my heart. You know, in his presence, that we have no choice. We have to be honest. He knows exactly what we're feeling. He knows what we're thinking. There's nowhere to hide this morning in his presence. Amen? Amen. We believe in a sovereign God who knows everything. Hallelujah. Maybe you've been going through the motions. Maybe you just find yourself going through the religious motions. You, you, there's, you, you know you're missing something. And this morning the dots have all been put together. And you know in your heart that you need to seek him with all your heart. I can't feel him, I can't hear him, but I want him. Remember, the number one thing he's going to do is remove the debris. Just give him the junk. Give him the, all the hindrances, the, the idols in your heart. that are. There's going to be something that's stopping that presence. The problem's not God. I've shared this many times, but when I was on duty in the police, I remember a church on that Lisburn Road, where our police station was, they had it up for months upon months. On outside that church, they had a question. If God seems far away, who's moved? Who has moved? And we know the answer. God has not moved. We have moved. We have just taken our own path. There's nothing more that's more important than his presence. Draw nigh to him, and he is going to draw nigh to you. There's nothing more important this morning than him. Oh God, Lord, once again, we're on holy ground this morning. Lord, we're talking about your manifest presence. Lord, without you, Lord, we're on our own, we're vulnerable. But with you, Lord, we have nothing to fear. Lord, With your presence in this house, you can do anything you want to this morning. The greatest miracle you can do this morning is change, Lord, the human heart from being toward self to being toward Christ. Lord, if there's someone here that's not right with you, they're not saved, would you save them this morning for time and eternity? If there's a backslider in here this morning, would you forgive them and bring them back to the Father's house? If there's a believer that has become negligence, negligent, would you just cause them to be diligent from this day forward? Forgive me, forgive this church, Lord, for any unbelief, any distractions that have allowed us to take our focus away from you. Lord, any confidence we have in our own ability, any pride, Anything, O oh God, that would stop you blessing this church, would you forgive us this morning? Lord, we just need to die to self and we need to live to you. Our meditation should be upon you. Our feelings and affection should be toward you. Help us, O oh God, to do that. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.